The Havoc Visual Debugger, or VDB, is a powerful tool for understanding what is happening in your game's physics simulation. It can also be used as a general tool for performance timings and debug drawing. The ability to record and replay videos means that problems can easily be identified through careful replay stepping, as well as by sharing videos with other Havoc users. Generally speaking, your game code sets up a server, which listens for VDB clients on a specified port. Multiple clients can connect to the same game server. Additionally, servers can be set up to listen to different Havoc worlds and broadcast their information on different ports. This can be useful for games with client-server architectures to see both the client's world and the server's world. So let's take a look at some code. I'm going to use the simple multi-threaded console demo. This demo is one of the standalone demos and can be very useful in understanding fundamentals of Havoc setup and teardown because it doesn't rely on the demo framework. After we've created an HKP world, we are ready to set up the visual debugger. Here we create an HKP physics context. This context provides physics information to game-side processes which can communicate with the VDB regarding a particular aspect of the physics world. Calling register all physics processes registers the default physics processes. Once registered, these will show up as viewers in the VDB, which can be enabled and disabled as we'll see a bit later. We then add any number of HKP worlds to our context and pass in any number of contexts to the HK Visual Debugger constructor. In almost all cases, there will only be one HKP physics context, one HKP world, and one HK Visual Debugger in your game. We then tell the HK Visual Debugger to start serving clients. If no port is passed in to this function, a default port is used. This completes the basic initialization of the HK Visual Debugger in your game. Perhaps the most powerful use of the Visual Debugger is as a performance analysis tool. Havoc tags up various tasks in its engine with timer macros. These macros record timestamps which can later be analyzed by the Visual Debugger. It gives you a window into the time taken by internal Havoc functions. Let's take a look at a few of these. HK Timer Begin and HK Timer End operate on a stack principle. If another timer begin occurs inside this block, it will get added to the stack. When an end occurs, it pops the topmost begin off the stack. When we visualize these timers later, timers that are inside blocks will appear as children of their parent blocks. For this reason, it's important that HK timer begin and HK timer ends get matched up one for one. Be careful of early returns in functions. Let's take a look at an example. HK timer begin sync model space. The object is currently not used, so you can pass in HK null. Another macro is HK timer begin list. This is useful for starting a list of timers which are all going to be siblings in the parent child hierarchy. Let's take a look at an example of this. Here I begin a list particle update. The very first timer underneath that is going to be smoke 1. I then split that, smoke 2, debris 1, debris 2. These will all show up as children of particle update. As I mentioned before, timer begin and ends operate on a stack principle. To avoid mistakes around early returns and functions, it can be useful to use HK time code block. It starts a timer and then creates an object on the stack which, when deleted, will end the timer. Another useful macro is monitor add value. This allows you to place a value into the timer stream from your game so that you can see it in the visual debugger. So here's an example of that. Despite the fact that it's not very intuitive, the second parameter should always be a float, and the third parameter should always be monitor type int. You can easily use these same macros to time portions of your game code as well. Because these macros simply record start and stop times using system API calls, it's important to note that any work done in a thread which preempts havoc during a begin, end, timer block will be included in that timer. In order to use timers in the VDB, there are certain setup requirements. First, you need to ensure that there is memory allocated to hold the timer data. To do this, we call HK Monitor Stream Get Instance Resize. This resizes the Monitor Stream instance for the calling thread, in this case, the main thread. For the HK CPU Job Thread Pool, we specify the Monitor Stream sizes with Timer Buffer Per Thread Allocation parameter. When the thread pool creates worker threads, it will resize their Monitor Streams to this value. If you are creating your own Havoc threads, you will have to do something similar. It's important to note that timing information is available in release libs as long as there is room in the monitor streams. In fact, performance timing doesn't really make sense in debug builds. In your final game, you will want to set these stream sizes to zero.
So how does data actually flow from your game to the VDB? First, your game steps the physics world. Physics processes which have been created on the game side as a result of enabling them in the VDB will have added themselves as listeners to the physics world. This allows them to take action when various physics events occurs. Most importantly, they will usually use the post-simulation callback to push data from the physics world into a buffer which gets sent to any listening VDB clients. Notice that your game must also call HK Visual Debugger Step. If you choose to call HK Visual Debugger Step with your game tick, your physics world step may have occurred multiple times between Visual Debugger steps. This can be useful for capturing all of the physics time in the Visual Debugger when you look at timings. However, it will also show you multiple contact points in each frame of the Visual Debugger, which can be a little bit misleading. Clients typically step their Visual Debugger with their physics world or with their game tick and understand the difference in what they're looking at. You'll also notice there's a file capture client in this diagram. If you call HK Visual Debugger Capture, you can send all this data to a file which can later be loaded by the VDB application. Now let's see the Visual Debugger application in action. First I'll run the demos with the dash D option, which enables the Visual Debugger. Then I will go to the Fountain demo. The VDB comes with the complete access distribution of Havoc and is located inside the Tools Visual Debugger folder. The first thing you might notice is that our application slows down quite a bit. This is a reflection of running in debug as well as all the information that we're sending over from the simulation to the visual debugger. Now let's just take a look through the application. For file you have your basic open dialog as well as recording the current simulation or stopping the current simulation, rewinding and other playback controls. You also have your network connections so this is where you tell the IP address you're connecting to as well as the port. You can also change the user keys for movement you can change the movement speeds or set it to be proportional to the point of interest. You also have settings regarding how the game side is going to send over geometry from your game. So your game could send over all your geometry at once, but sometimes this can be prohibitively slow or possibly even cause out of memory crashes. So Havoc allows you to divide geometry up into parts and send it over piecemeal. Additionally, every time the VDB connects, the game could resend the geometry over. However, if you're constantly disconnecting and reconnecting, this can be annoyingly slow. So Havoc also adds the option of sending hashes to client. This stores the geometry on the client side and associates it with hashes so that reconnection is much quicker. There's not much in tools other than being able to customize toolbars and keyboards, so we're not going to look into that too much. There's many options in view, and I'm not going to go over all of them, but the important ones are things like what to draw in terms of the axes, which axes is up, which uh, coordinate system to be using. You can also change the way the camera behaves. One of the more useful options here is fit camera to world, which will put your entire world in the view of the camera. You can also tweak the camera settings directly. Oftentimes it's helpful to change the near plane so it's not cutting your world. Additionally, there is an HK update camera macro which can be used to supply the VDB with a particular view from your game. This is very useful for having a camera track your player, for instance, and then having it show up in the visual debugger. You also have a number of render states, such as backface calling, wireframe, outline faces. These are all useful debug tools. One of the more useful ones is also randomized colors. This will randomly color each rigid body in your simulation, immediately showing you how many rigid bodies you have. One of the most useful render state items is the stack graph overlay, which you can see running here in the bottom. As you can see, the StackGraph overlay provides a graphical representation of the timer data that's being sent over from your game. From the physics timers that are inside internal Havoc libs, you can even see timing data. This is covered pretty in depth inside the multi-threaded demo, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. You can also change the layout to support multiple views. This can be useful for viewing your game from several different angles and also from di having different debug information being shown. We also have a number of windows that are used by various viewers to display data. Mem, mem used and alloc are used by the world memory viewer. Perf summary text and these perf channels are used by the statistics viewer. This is another way that timer data can be displayed in your game. Here we can see the timer data streaming over in real time. You can navigate this text view with the up and down arrow keys and left and right keys. The other perf channels correspond to a Havoc thread, zero being the main thread and the rest of them being worker threads. You can then enable timers in these views 
and draw them out in the perf channel. This is good for seeing how long functions are taking in your game over time. The console text is simply a text area in the VDB application which allows for the VDB to output information as well as your game to output information. There are many viewers that get registered by default as well as by the call to register default physics processes. So we're not going to go over all of them, just some of the more important ones. Debug display viewer is a viewer which will draw debugged lines and stars and points and many other different things which can be executed from your game code. There are also parts of the Havoc code that use this, for instance the character proxy. Statistics is the viewer that sends over the timer data, which allows you to see it in the text format or in the stack graph overlay. Grab memory snapshot allows you to take a memory snapshot of your game and load it up in the memory analyzer. Broad phase shows you the broad phase outlines of all the objects in your world. Many of the rest of these are fairly self-explanatory. Or look in the documentation for more information. You may notice that the game pauses when you access the VDB menu. This is intentional so that if there's a problem going on, you can immediately pause your game to turn on a viewer or enable a view that will allow you to see the problem better. One of the more important aspects of the VDB is its ability to record and play back videos. Oftentimes you can't catch problems in real time as they're happening or see very good performance information in real time. You can record a video by hitting the record button or accessing it from the menu. So let's just record a movie here. It's important to note that when recording a movie, only the viewers that are currently checked will actually push data into the recorded movie. So if you don't, for instance, turn on the broad phase viewer, there won't be any broad phase information in the movie that you record. After you've recorded enough data, hit the stop button. You can then load this movie up. This is good because you can play it frame by frame with the scrub bar at the bottom. You can also step forward by a frame and backward by a frame. This can be really useful for seeing problematic frames in the timers. As I mentioned earlier, there's often a lot of time in post-simulation callback. That's because this is the callback in which most of the viewers send data over to the VDB. This can usually be safely ignored unless your game uses this callback for game-specific reasons. In this view, you can see thread information as well as average information. You can also see in parentheses the amount of times this timer was hit during the VDB step. Another nice feature of the VDB architecture is that it's very easy to create custom viewers. Here are some steps. First, you need to create a class that inherits from HK process. This is required in order to be registered with HK Visual Debugger and send over data to the VDB. You may also want to consider inheriting from other listener interfaces to aid in information gathering. Most viewers that you would make will likely get some valuable setup from HKP World Viewer Base. This parent class will automatically set up your viewer to receive important callbacks from the HKP physics context. We'll see this in a minute. The second thing you need to do is register the process with HK Process Factory. The HK Process Factory is responsible for maintaining a list of processes which can be created. This is analogous to a list of viewers which can be enabled from the VDB's perspective. The last thing you need to do is to gather and send data to the VDB. Every created HK process will get a step callback when the HK Visual Debugger instance gets stepped by your game. However, most viewers collect and send their data at the same time from listener callbacks. Let's see what this looks like in code. Here I've constructed a very simple viewer. I inherit from HKP World Viewer Base as it helps with some setup as we'll see in a moment. I also inherit from World Post Simulation Listener, which will allow me to receive callbacks after the physics world has stepped. First, I overload world added callback and world remove callback. These are callbacks that are going to occur if a world gets added or removed from the HKP physics context. I automatically get added as a listener for those sorts of callbacks by the HKP world viewer base. In these callbacks, I'm going to add or remove myself as a post simulation listener from the world. Next, let's look at my constructor. The HKP world viewer base automatically goes through these contexts and finds the physics context and assigns it to m underscore context. So I know that if this is filled out that I have a physics context. I go through that context's worlds and I call world added callback for those worlds. In my destructor I do something similar except I, rem I call the remove callback. Next I create a static function for creating an instance of my viewer. I also create a static function register viewer. 
What it does is it gets the singleton HK process factory and calls register process on it with the name of my viewer and a pointer to the static function to create my viewer. The process factory will return a unique tag ID, which I need to store for later. I also override the get process tag function, in which I return the unique tag that I got from the process factory. This allows game code to identify instances of a process by its unique tag. Next, I'll override post simulation callback. This will get called once per physics world step. In this callback, I'm going to use the display handler to update a camera which is centered on the ball and points down the x-axis. I'm also going to display some 3D text at the ball position. And lastly, I'm going to draw a line between the origin and the ball. This step callback occurs during the HK Visual Debugger step. Here, I'm just going to call display text on the display handler and send some text to the VDB remote console. So let's see what this looks like in action. At setup time, after I call register all physics processes, I now also call register viewer on my viewer class. When the world gets added to the context, my viewer will be notified and it will be added as a post simulation listener. So let's see what this looks like. So here's my scene and here's my ball. You'll notice that my viewer now shows up in the list of viewers because I registered it with the HK process factory. When I turn on the viewer, an instance of my viewer is created, and you can see it do its work. It's creating a line between the ball and the origin. It's drawing some text at the location of the ball. It's also spamming the real-time remote console window on the VDB with some text. And lastly, it's updating a camera that I can use in the VDB to track the ball. If I go to user cameras, I'll notice that the ball cam has been added to this list. If creating a custom viewer seems like a lot of work, you can also use debug draw macros found in hkdebugdisplay.h. These macros will automatically access the debug display singleton and push debug information to the debug display viewer in the VDB. I hope you now feel equipped to use this powerful tool in debugging and profiling in your games. Enjoy.